first I'm going to introduce Ken and have Ken tell us kind of what has his, his attention is on right now. So Ken, welcome. Thanks for coming uh, to this event. And please uh, take the screen back away from me. I'm going to stop sharing right now um, so we can hear from you. Absolutely. And I'm going to turn off my video too. So it's all about you right now. Excellent. Let me uh, share my screen. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, and I also, uh, give me a moment. So great. Just to check, can you, can you see the, the slide deck now? Yep. Wonderful. So hi, everyone. My name is uh, Ken Greenbaum. I'm the Director of Digital Learning and Ed Technology with the Oregon Department of Education. Um, also, I uh, want to acknowledge my colleague. I work closely with Carla Wade, um, also uh, with us today. And I know Carl's going to be on a panel later today. Carla, what time's your, your panel this afternoon? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Definitely go to that, too. Uh, Carl has uh, so much... Um, uh, was in ideas and thoughts uh, to share. So um, thank you for uh, for for having us here today. And um, I'm going to present today. I know it's a, a quick 20 minutes here uh, before we head off to to lunch around equitable grading practices, um, technology, and, and motivation. And just equitable grading is something at the agency we're thinking um, deeply about, and its intersection with technology and motivation for students uh, as it pertains to one of the themes of. Of, of this uh, uh, virtual conference is something that's front of mind. And so hoping to draw some connections here today. I know we're, um, at least for the, the live portion, a small intimate group here. So uh, it's definitely some discussion questions. I would uh, in encourage everyone to either in the chat or, or unmute uh, for those times. I would love to hear your ideas and, and learn, learn from each other. So before, before I, I dive in, I um, want to acknowledge that grading conversations can feel like Groundhog Day. Um, that, that image on the left, I, I've been told is a groundhog, not a prairie dog. Uh, but you know, it's, it's one of these conversations, I know for myself as a, as a teacher, as a principal, just seeing how grading played out differently for, for different students and, and knowing that we had to do something differently. Um, and, and then now, even after those conversations have continued, that grading practices are very much at the forefront of schooling during the public health crisis. It, it can feel like Groundhog's Day, like we're having this grading conversation again. Um, and, and yes, and, and we need to. Uh, with that, also I want to acknowledge that the, it can feel like poking the hornet's nest, right? Uh, that image on the right, that these are rightfully challenging conversations that really, um, if we're doing them well, get at our values, um, talk about uh, what we believe about education and students. And so these can be hard conversations that might feel like they're happening over and over. So I um, wanted to acknowledge that as we go into this discussion and, and beyond that that is one of those feelings. I did not include um, like the image of the, you know, uh, person rowing the canoe that's uh, up to water, uh, like, you know, right up to their neck. And so I want to acknowledge also that there's a lot going on for a lot of you and, and all of us in the education world. And so just really appreciate your, your engagement today with just a, a lot of things happening. So with that, I think there's a, a collective feeling that this is a, a moment in education for, for great change or, or, you know, positive disruption. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that, that grading is really one of those issues um, that can be a uh, change for the better. So I wanna center us in, in equity um, uh, as we have this conversation about, about grading. So I'm just gonna read this quote. I know we have uh, at least one, one participant on the phone here. Schools are a major part of society's institutional processes for maintaining a relatively stable system of inequality. They contribute to these results by active acceptance and utilization of a dominant set of values, norms, and beliefs, which while appearing to offer opportunities to all actually support the success of a privileged minority and hinder the efforts and visions of a majority from a group at the uh, Center for Education Reform. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge that throughout this discussion that many current grading practices are a part of this dominant set of values, norms, and beliefs, and that our values, norms, and beliefs influence our grading practices and those can either contribute to or dismantle inequitable systems. So moving forward, I think, uh, especially given the history of grading, uh, the research, um, the past century about how inconsistent grading practices can be, that uh, we're centered and acknowledge that this, this is an equity discussion. Grading is, um, is, is a central part of equity work. 
So today it'll be a, be a quick ride uh, pre-lunch um, to identify three equitable grading practices, which also contributes to student motivation. Um, one of my goals today is that yes, we uh, acknowledge some like concrete kind of do tomorrow type elements around equitable grading, um, motivation and the interaction with technology, but also um, uh, acknowledging that these are, there's change management around this that is deeper than just um, only concrete technical outcomes. So to set the stage a little, ODE developed guidance on addressing grades and credit options for district consideration in, in response to concerns that were shared with us about um, increased failure rates, particularly in the early grades in high school, uh, but also for some seniors who are really trying to climb their way out towards graduation during, during a pandemic. The resource includes four actions uh, that districts can take, um, and I'm going to reference those in, in a moment and dive deeper into those. Um, but also wanted to mention before going any further, um, Oregon's credit options, uh, which provide high schools with some ways to meet the needs of students who have not been able to meet graduation requirements in conventional ways, uh, can be pursued uh, uh, that, that credit via Oregon's credit options. Um, and I will put uh, the link to, to these options in the chat uh, before we finish uh, off today. So uh, one thing I'm gonna go back here a slide that I wanted to reference, the grading for equity resource here, um, in addition to the guidance I just uh, uh, referenced, are really what I'll be pulling from and referencing today. Um, and uh, Joe Feldman has done some great work. There are lots of great uh, uh, works out there uh, and, and resources. A lot of what you're seeing today is, is grounded in this. So I wanted to one, uh, give credit where credit is due and two, just um, acknowledge that if there's questions we don't dive deeper into um, today, this is a, a great resource um, um, for doing that. So Feldman, uh, talks about three pillars, accuracy, bias, resistance, and motivation in terms of equitable grading. And we develop these, these tenants that you see in front of you now um, as we digested the book, uh, Grading for Equity, um, and kind of did some more research and, and, and took those pillars and, and thought about these, these, these tenants, right? So mathematically accurate grades, equitable grading has to be mathematically accurate, both in computation and scale based on proficiency, right? Uh, not accumulated points around behavior, participation, effort, which has a, has a lot of bias uh, built in there, right? Um, open for retake opportunities. We, they need to be based on content that the instructor has provided, right? We, we kind of added that ourselves um, uh, as opposed to from Feldman, uh, simply as a, as a measure of of, of, of fairness, right? Um, what is assessed, it has to be what was taught. Um, great equitable grades should be weighted so that more recent achievement um, is given additional weight. So this idea of eliminating averages based on individual summative performances, criterion reference as opposed to a normative or uh, based on a curve and bias resistant um, using rubrics which can increase transparency, reliability if, if they're well-designed rubrics. And so these tenants, you know, I know the things that I learned about grading uh, the hard way as, as, as a teacher, right? Um, they, they didn't feel right. And, and in terms of um, uh, changing practices over time, uh, I, I wish I had training. And so what uh, we're, we're hoping uh, is that these tenants actually start to give a foundation from which, from which to learn. Today, whoop, today, um, gonna really focus on on the first three. We we can we can probably write a dissertation on on uh, you know each one of these, um, and just want to touch upon the the three uh, on top there: mathematical accuracy, uh, grades based on proficiency, and an openness to retakes, um, and see how their the actions we're gonna name here are also connected to student motivation. Four actions, um, also named in our guidance: retakes. Minimum grading, um, and so uh, no zeros, eliminating zeros, renaming grades, and a focus on form and assessment and feedback. And so uh, for the sake of time, we're only gonna uh, talk to the first three, um, get concrete, talk a little bit about technology and how it relates, and open up for discussion, um, and then uh, close out with some, some resources. Also want to acknowledge that 
these actions in and of themselves, right, are, are not going to necessarily uproot the, the inequitable systems that are deeply rooted in our education system. Uh, and there is some deep digging to do um, with these and with our, our teams and our organizations, but these are actions that move us towards that place. And so hopefully there are some concrete takeaways from today and, and, and discussion starters. Retakes and redos. So a system of required retakes um, and uh, redos of summative assessments, which are hopefully counted, count the most recent work and, and weight the most recent work, um, encourages learning from mistakes. It motivates students uh, by, by really feeling success and it creates, it creates hope, quite frankly, in, in addition to ensuring that students ultimately learn the content that they need. Um, Another really important point I think is sometimes lost in this is that it also really honors different learning speeds and the temporal nature of learning and that cyclical nature. Now, there, there are challenges here, right? Like there, there are big questions that arise, right? Like which assessments for redo and retakes? Um, how long to allow? Like, will, will I be, uh, you know, as a teacher, will I be uh, regrading till now until the end of the semester? Like, all through, right? There are te there are logistical elements here. What deadlines? Right? Does this kind of like the, the big question that comes up often? Does this prepare students for quote the real world? So while these are big questions, I think taking time to dig into these, right? Starting the conversation, like, what real world are we really talking about specifically? What what should a grade represent? How is our system of redos and retakes um, or not reflecting our values about students? That this is a, a key strategy that can, can lead towards more equitable, more equitable grading. Hey, Ken. Yeah. Um, this is Leilani. So I'm just thinking how this is applicable in the current environment. It, it, it's almost like a non-negotiable because so many students are asking for a mutation in time and schedule. So you, you have to disaggregate the whole group construct and allow testing to be sort of a separate rail of taking and retaking and redoing. This is just, this is our idea of like, what's really, you know, just learning council research, just looking at what the norm is now for use of time and, and the, and the, I've had several superintendents say they're feeling like it's the death of whole group you know, the whole group mantra. Um, so anyway, I'm agreeing with you that this is a, this is a non-negotiable, really, the retake. Absolutely, and thank you for bringing up like assessments, like the idea, again, kind of the limits of time, like if we were to double click even more into this, this notion of how does formative versus summative assessment play into systems that are equitable as it, as it speaks to retakes and redos, those are like critical questions. And this, does tend to be, to your point, a, a place where we have to really explore like individual and collective like grades and points and how those intersect and also how our systems of retakes and redos are really at the, the ground level, right? Like what are they communicating to students? And this is one concrete way, I'm going to say relatively easy to, to implement that creates um, more equitable grading systems. So thank you, Leilani. Second action, minimum grading and eliminating zeros. So the quote I have there, I didn't attribute to any specific student because we all know students who have felt this way like or, or articulated this, right? Like I have so many zeros, like how am I going to climb out of this mountain? And so my motivation disappears, right? And so zeros, mathematically put students at the bottom of a mountain that can seem or actually mathematically be impossible to climb. Um, setting a minimum grade of 50% reorients the traditional grading scale away from failure and towards a system which allows students, especially those experiencing what I'm gonna name as intermittent early low performance to have a choice. So this idea creates hope, right? It, and it is more likely to ensure that students stay motivated and it preserves the po that possibility of success. So a few things. One, like a, a question that immediately comes up, right? Like, 
what, well, what about a missing assignment? What does that communicate? How's this gonna work? A few pieces. One, this assumes the zero to 100 point system, which in of itself kind of this image shows is flawed. And that's, we, we're not gonna have time to dive into that today. Highly recommend like doing some research, dive into the Feldman book a bit, but you can see 60% of the possible scores represent failure. Right, um, but given that this traditional system is is so common, um, we wanted to offer minimum grading and eliminating zeros as, as one way um, to uh, make grading more equitable and more motivating. Won't grades be inflated? What about missing assignments? Um, all these things like our students won't try, and, and there's some research on this. Um, and anecdotally. I think as we explore with ourselves and our teams, what actually happens when we um, reduce this, this hole of a, of a zero and a student grade, that students are actually more motivated. Um, and it minimizes the, minimize the impact of what in the research is called intermittent early low performance, which really can get students dug in a hole. I, I also think what's really interesting if we think about early intermittent low performance, right? Maybe it's because students have to take care of family members. Maybe it's unreliable transportation in the traditional setting, or maybe unreliable internet, right? Like what are all these reasons outside of student control that might lead to early intermittent low performance? And this um, shift to minimum grading and eliminating zeros, um, research, research identifies that those particular challenges early on, it helps to mitigate that. So again, this connection to equity um, and the current, current reality. Thirdly, uh, renaming. So just looking at those quotes on the left and right, what, what mindsets um, and what conversation do we want our students and teachers to be having, right? I'm an F student, I'm a D student, or, you know, we, we don't have enough information really yet to know how much you know, and we, we but what, what are we going to do about that together? And so renaming grades, which is, seems cosmetic, um, but just simply shifting language from, you know, an A, which is a very abstract concept, to more descriptive action-based um, temporal words can make a huge difference about how we communicate our beliefs and expectations about student learning to students and families. Um, this also shifts grades to be active as opposed to like a fixed mindset, right? It, it, these, this language assumes progress. A lot of software, um, not all, but many can, can substitute the letter grade with an abbreviation. And, and, you know, schools have found you can convert back and forth if needed for external reporting and whatnot, but this is just one way, again, to, to move towards a mo more motivating, equitable um, grading practice. So I went through a lot uh, really fast, um, kind of grounded in these first three tenets. Um, we, can, we can dig a lot deeper, um, but this connection te to technology is something that I, uh, you know, love to start to think about. I have a hypothesis I'd love to share with the, the, the group a bit, um, but would, uh, pardon me, we, someone wanted to share via phone. Um, <laughs> I'd love to hear uh, just from those uh, um, participating, Jim, John, Kimberly, I, I know a lot's going on, but would love to unmute. We can shift that way, uh, Doug, Milani, to have folks perhaps be able to unmute. To, to just really think about this, excuse me, this question, right? Where have you seen technology and what role does it play in making grading more or, or, or less, less equitable? Yeah, and this is Leilani. I think um, what I'm experiencing as I look at what you, uh, the work that you're doing and what that could mean if, if there's a concerted effort to substantiate it scientifically and uh, look at what the outcomes are in terms of what happens then, I, I, think, I think what we're looking at is something that needs to be standardized in the technology realm. Like that's something the Learning Council can definitely help you with, with all of the vendors um, through our digital learning experience standards on the UI UX side. Um, the UI UX of software right now, a lot of it's really good. Like there's some stuff out there that's really good. 
and it's using point systems. It's using this, it's using that. And everybody has their own little way of doing things in the design world. A lot of former educators working for software companies, but there's no standard. And that's complexifying the, the manual side of what you're addressing right now. And if we're going to make this real as a, something that people adopt and think with, it has to show up in the software too. So that would be something that I think we can help address. But, but as I think about it, it's a mountain of like what we would have to do. Um, yeah. The consumer software side is not doing anything with, uh, you know, pass fail grading levels because they're not approaching anything as a whole group. It's all individual, which is now what people are used to. And then you get your, like your little bursts of gold stars when you achieve competency in something and there's no grades, right? There's just like, you know, here's your, you've moved along and here's your little graph showing you what's going on. And I think that that has to come into play too, Ken. You know, the expectancy of the consuming public is what they're experiencing in the software world. And we're grading them still. So the way that you're looking at it is, is fantastic because it, it's, it's not a all or nothing. It's, there's another way to go, which is what software is doing. Right? It's like, oh, you didn't pass this. I'm going to pelt you with 16 other ways to think about it until you get it. And then I'm going to test you again. And then you're going to pass. Right. So, it, you know, I, I think this is a must do, but it's still in the whole group arena, which is obviously where most schools still are. Um, but it moves it in the direction of a new middle ground that makes it meet the software world, which is cool. Absolutely. And I think you bring a great point of like, um, and I'll touch upon this in, in, in a moment around, you know, the marketplace of technology, like what's driving, is it educator and um, district and education at large saying, hey, here's, here's what we need, here are the tools we need, or vice versa in terms of design? Um, absolutely, Leonie. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that, I think that that's a really a big thing. Can you go back to that slide that showed the new five levels? No forward one. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and you know, the, we can, again, um, like huge conversations here, right, around standards-based grading and what that means and how that interfaces with different software and how that makes the actual, like, not only mindset, but actual usability and, and behavior change, so to speak, um, more possible and promoted, right? Um, are the tools that we're using reflective of the values that we're trying to communicate um, with our teams, with our students, with our families? Okay. Thank you, Leilani. And, and in, in terms of uh, some of the scientific research, there are, and I'll have a, a, a slide at the end that'll be in, included in the materials that you can, um, there, there is some research um, around supporting some of how this impacts students and motivation and whatnot. I'll pause for one moment. Any, anyone else uh, in terms of participations want to just share in, current, in terms of like their reflections on the role of technology in terms of uh, equitable grading or not? Yeah, I think Doug, you, Doug, you have to mark people for being able to talk. Otherwise they have to type and stuff. It's so much work. <laughs> and I know we're close to time. I know we're close to time here as well. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and wrap up and we can certainly okay. um, continue coming. So um one hypothesis, like to, to build on what Oilani was talking about, you know, um from the like real teacher student experience, one hypothesis, and I'm not sure this is right that to think about, is that you know as we think about like why now, like why is grading come to the forefront now in this moment? Now, going back to the Groundhog Day <laughs> slide, right? It, it has always been, the inequitable grading has, has always been something we have to think about and talk about, but it's being amplified um, as are many other inequ inequities in the system. Um, and so one hypothesis, and this could be wrong, but I think one factor is that technology tends to make certain elements of schooling like completion, participation, effort, which has a lot of bias built in, 
uh, very augmented in a remote setting, right? So like, for example, like in a classroom as a teacher, like my camera is never off, right? There's nuances I can see in, in that interaction. Um, however, in a remote setting, what is front and center for me as a teacher is literally this, right? Literally student faces in boxes on and off or, or assignments counted in a queue. And I think this can emphasize, even if unintentionally, right? It emphasizes this participation and completion aspect of grading, right? There's the, also the role of algorithms, um, the appearance of scientific measurements uh, when we see like, certain scales and grades in, in Qs and LMSs and, and the ability for learning management systems and other software to do, like it relies to speaking to this, proficiency-based grading or, um, you know, whether or not they are, they are technical accelerators or barriers to equitable grading practices, there's, it's a wide range, right? And so I think these are just very, very amplified. And so I bring this up because I think it's, it's um, helpful to think about this possible influence of, of technology, of like how it, uh, it can change or amplify certain aspects of, of schooling and, and student learning and how that gets translated into current or new grading practices. So I, I recognize I'm, I'm running on time here, but I wanna leave you with uh, uh, two pieces. I wanna recognize like, I've named these as though like, oh, we can do some of these tomorrow. And, and there are elements that are very much technical. And I mean that in a figurative sense, like, you know, this is the Heifetz's model around adaptive and technical challenges. And if we read through these, like part of this grading for equity conversation lands squarely in the technical problems, right? There are things, especially in the, in the world in which many of us live in the digital learning world, the IT space, there are some that are truly technical in that sense. Um, there are also many, if not more, that really land in that adaptive place. This, this is about change management, right? Um, or about our beliefs and systems. And so I, I think it's sometimes helpful to have frameworks in which to think about that change management and those discussions when they can be that hornet's nest, so to speak. And so um, we offer to here either that technical adaptive framework, uh, sometimes what is also helpful um, is the kind of discourse one, discourse two uh, conversation. There's, there's a lots of different frameworks out there, but I think, you know, without really taking a step back in terms of organizational leadership of what, how are we talking and thinking about grading? How are we talking and thinking about technology and student motivation? Are we making sure we're living in the discourse two or the adaptive space enough? Um, because it's, it's kind of easy to jump to discourse one or easy to jump to technical, uh, figuratively technical solutions, although the literally technical pieces are super important as well. Just wanna leave us um, with some quotes that bring us back to living in an, uh, an equity space. I won't read these, but I'll let you um, read through them and absorb them. And that these practices or lack thereof have an immense real impact, often disproportionately um, for students who are underserved and that it is critical that be it through technology or not, or technology as an accelerator, that um, we are moving towards more equitable grading practices. With that, um, just uh, a lot of uh, gratitude. Um, um, myself, along with two of my colleagues not here today, um, Alexa and Dan, who are also digging into this work. I want to acknowledge uh, Carla Wade also on this call. She'll be on the panel uh, later. Uh, please feel uh, free to reach out and how OD can support this. We have a few initiatives that we're uh, working on to see how we can foster and do some of this work around equitable grading throughout the state. So be on the lookout for that. If you have ideas, please do reach out. And included in the materials, um, just some additional examples uh, around like how this plays out in schools um, and, uh, and additional resources in terms of, uh, Ilani mentioned, you know, what's the research, what's the impact. So uh, we'll include these in, in, in materials um, and please do uh, reach out. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. And um Please feel free to join us again at 2.30 if you're still around or, or stay on all day and just put us in mute and in the background. Um, 2.30, we're going to 
go a little deeper into this discussion as, as well as the new standards and basics that are hitting schools, the new learning experience standards. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. It was a delight to meet you. I wish, we, I, wish I could have met you in person. Absolutely, same. Uh, one day, I'm sure. And, and uh, to the educators out there on the call, just uh, and really appreciate um, everyone's uh, uh, hard work and commitment to, to kids in what is a very challenging time. Yeah, and we're also going to need your slides, FYI. So when we editorialize the video, we can stick all the links in there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay, great. We're going to go on to some lunch and learn discussions about some new technologies that are coming out and what's happening with them that is going to affect the landscape in 2021. This is uh, Leilani Cawthon, your host with the Learning Council, News Media and Research Organization. Excited to be with everyone today. You know, these recordings get picked up and watched by so many people after we do them. So I want to make sure that I mention that I am now uh, very challenged by what uh, Ken just shared, because I realize there's a lot more to talk about now. We're in a different situation with regards to equity. And I think this is, this, this, this well goes deep. I have Brandon Levine on. Brandon, share your video. Yeah, there you are. Okay, good. And you're taking the screen. Good. Okay. So let me have you uh, kick this off and then I'm going to come back on Brandon and just chat with you for a few minutes. So go ahead. Yes, thank you, Leilani. Uh, truly appreciate uh, being here today. Um, but yes, my name is Brandon Levine. Um, I'm based here out of Houston, Texas, um, representing Identity Automation. And today we really just want to talk about, you know, where we see the future of identity management, uh, why it is important. And, and with that, I do understand we have a mixed audience. So I will try to keep it a high level and maybe go a little bit deeper. And then from there, uh, we can go into some questions. So. I'm sure everyone can agree that last year we really saw a huge curveball, right? We really saw that, you know, in order to deliver learning outcomes um, within school districts, you know, it really starts with having a, an identity driven approach just because, you know, oftentimes school districts are having to see, you know, you know, where students are, which, uh, which classes are they in, which school district are they in, which school are they a part of? And so to kind of level set, you know, to even get to that point, we have to understand what is the full life cycle of the identity, right? So at a high level, it really starts with whether a student is entering a school district, um, whether a new teacher is entering a school district. Um, within that, there's a lot of changes that happen in between. Um, there's cl uh, class level changes, um, you know, uh, teachers may uh, change courses. And then finally, you know, uh, the identity is going to leave. So at a high level, that's what it looks like. But in reality, you know, it's much deeper than that. And as I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm, I'm setting this up to kind of go deeper into the bigger picture. Um, so to truly understand how to deliver personalized learning outcomes, it really starts with understanding the full life cycle of the identity, what all goes into it in order to get to that outcome. Um, so um, today, um, a lot of people think, you know, this is on the plate of IT teams, um, but one of my favorite quotes is identity management is a team sport, right? So this is really a district-wide initiative in order to help uh, school, uh, school districts um, um, get the outcomes that they're looking for. So it really starts with creating the identity, right? So um, oftentimes, single sign-on is viewed as you know, the foundation, but before we can even get to SSO, you know, we have to understand what type of user are we dealing with? Um, because as I mentioned last year, right, we really saw that the user population expanded. Usually when we talk about users, we're thinking teachers um, as well as students, but now it's actually more than that, right? We have to consider parents and guardians, contractors, um, even substitutes, um, as well as uh, faculty and staff and things like that. Um, so as we're provisioning those users, right? We have to go through the full life cycle. Um, at some point, they're going to have to change their passwords. Who handles that, right? Oftentimes, school districts in the IT help desk, they're really bogged down with resetting passwords, which takes away from um, doing more strategic initiatives. Um, so there has to be some sort of element of delegating that to, uh, to the educators to where they can either change passwords um, just to have that increased uptime to maximize the instruction time. 
Um, then from there, you're going to go through the full life cycle. Then you want to end up in deprovisioning that account. So, you know, why does that matter? I'm going to switch screens here. And before I go, do I have any questions in the, in the chat, Leilani, before I continue? I don't see any. So continue. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Right. So, so why does this matter? Right. Um, so uh, with identity automation, right, as I mentioned earlier, we truly believe um, that identity management should be the foundation um, of, of the strategy to deliver learning outcomes. Um, because, right, in order to personalize the learning experience, we have to understand what type of identity that we are dealing with. Um, so as everyone can see my screen, um, you know, in order to even keep the students safe, right, we have to truly understand, you know, what applications are they using, right? And, and also understand that with the remote learning and things that comes with that, we truly have to see that we have to protect the students to keep them safe just so they can, um, you know, um, have access to uh, the resources and things that they're, that they're dealing with. But more importantly, right, we really have to free up the IT staff um, because what we're seeing today is that there's a lot of changes that are happening. Um, and with that, we understand that school districts have to do a lot more with less. Um, so with that, we have to automate that, which is where the power of wrapped identity comes into place. And then with that, right, we have to make sure that everyone has um, day one access. Um, so in order to even um, go into the curriculum, right, we have to make sure that everyone has access to the right applications, um, whether it's within the LMSs, um, from, from day one. So I know that was very high level, uh, Leilani. Um, I'm more than happy uh, to, to field some, some questions if we have any. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to take back the screen. Um, share my screen. So that was you, Brandon. Um, and there's a couple of other things that happened uh, with the Learning Council working with identity automation so far. So I'm going to bring this up really quickly. Either you or Carter can co comment on this. But um, there was a survey that was run in January and a good distribution of leadership to the teacher ranks including some state level administrators. And these are the things that we found out um, from what happened in that. And there's a white paper out now from Identity Automation about a lot of these things and the meaningfulness of them with regards to, Brandon, what you were just sharing on identity. Um, this is pretty significant stuff. So I'm gonna go back to make sure I'm sharing my video. Nobody wants to just listen. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to share this data. So uh, essentially 35% of students are not showing up online nationally. This is true when we talk to individual districts. This is why Brandon was talking about identity. Um, you know, being able to encapsulate more than just, I'm going to roster this kid into the system, but encapsulate identity with more tags, it has an effect on equity it has an effect on the student getting the things that they like and, and need. And you'll see some of that already happening in some of the individual courseware. So individual courseware uh, asks you questions, just like in the consumer software market. And it says like, do you like unicorns or dinosaurs? And a few other things, kind of like that website Stitch Fix, it figures out your fashion preferences. And then it only shows you stuff that you want to see. So this whole idea of, the wraparound identity is, you know, 10, 15 years old of being used at extremes in the private sector, but it's now coming to roost in schools because of the fracturing of where the kids are, right? Like online-ness is changing everything. So, so Brandon, I'm just going a little deeper into what you were just talking about. Um, and then this other slide, students who sometimes have the wrong materials, well, that's not going to work. 15% of kids getting the wrong materials. Okay, so they're not going to learn when that happens. And then you look at the far slide on here, which is 51% of American students, students are in a position of lost achievement right now. This is huge. Um, and then, then you have 34% who can't easily navigate online systems and apps. We've had countless administrators now tell the Learning Council over the course of this last year that they have to spend a tremendous amount of time just helping parents even, you know, superintendents and finance staff and, 
Um, you know, even the janitor, maybe you're on the phone or answering the phone as a hotline all day, just because so many people are like, I can't turn this on. I, where do I find what? I don't get it. Um, this is happening all across America. These are basic problems. Um, and then students have opted out because of, of uh, re out of re-enrollment right now, 15%. We originally said it was only about 3.6% additional over the existing 27% that would are, had already opted out by 2019. So this is not a small thing. This puts us up in the 42% range of nationally students didn't come back or aren't coming back, um, not small. And then the other part, and this whole survey um, is thanks to identity automation, is that you have these four things happening. So number one, the one at the top uh, left, teachers who can't easily navigate and use online systems, we still are at 30% needing, you know, that can't. So we need more training. And it's almost like an infinite need for more training because there's new systems coming in and new pieces of software being added to the stack all the time. And then unable to easily personalize that 47%. So we're still whole grouping in online, which didn't work in the early days of distance learning. That's where we lost kids and it's not gonna work today. And so the structural shift is really necessary to continue the dialogue about. And then teachers are overly sidetracked into repetitive distribution and collection of assignments, resources, communications, 40%. Let me just walk you through how that is. So teacher spends a good quarter of their time already right now doing uh, finding things to plot into lessons and then plotting the lessons. And after that's done, distributing it, sometimes that's easy, like in an LMS, click the button, everybody gets the resource or gets told to go into this resource, please do module X or read chapter Y in the digital book or whatever. And then step two, step three, step four. The traffic on the teacher with email is enormous and inside systems enormous because not only do you push it out to the whole group, but then everybody pelts it back at you. This is a very different traffic pattern and time than when you were live in the classroom. So this is why it's a structural shift. Um, and, then, and then also you have parents calling and uh, kids need help at midnight. And so there, there's this whole disarray about um, how do you service kids after hours and things like that? So right now you're sitting nationally, 74% um, of teachers exp feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. So of course, part of that is just we're all in a new uh, circumstance and maybe eventually this is gonna sort of shake out a little bit. Um, but at this percentage, it's sort of a cataclysm. So anyway, so this is why um, with Brandon and identity automation, there's so much attention from the Learning Council on nailing this idea of upping our identity management game in schools and districts and even state level because it has a direct corollary to the workload of every teacher. And so we're not talking about simple identity we're talking about identity that accrues unto itself things about that student or that teacher, like their preferences, their scores, um, any, any learning difficulties, all those things are wrapped in there. And then that's mobile across uh, different systems and it picks up recommendations and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really glad you were with us, Brandon. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leilani. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you don't mind me just chatting along about 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 your company and all that. So Oh, love it. <laughs> okay, cool.